Welcome to Construction Math and the review for the fourth quarter final. So have your note takers out and your worksheets and we'll be ready to start. First of all, you will not have to memorize these formulas. They will be given to you. Remember the one volume equals pi r squared h is for cylinders because in a cylinder you need to know the radius and also the height. In a sphere, all we need to know is the radius to be able to find the volume. So those will be on your test as they were on your practice test or your review. So question number one on your review said find the volume of a cylinder. So be thinking about which of the two formulas you're going to use with a radius of 10 inches and a height of 22 inches. Now the key thing here is we need, know that we need to know the radius it's given and the height. So we're ready to go to our slates and we're ready to look at the formula. So the formula here is volume equals pi r squared h. So I'm going to go to the um, my problem and pull out the information. The radius on this particular problem was 10 inches and that's squared times the height was 22 inches. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to take in your calculator and you're going to take pi or you could use 3.14 times 10 times 10 times 22. If you have a scientific calculator and it has parentheses and exponents, you could also put it in as pi and a pi key. You could put it in as this, 10 squared times 22. And either way you do it, you should come out with approximately the answer of 6,911.5. And now I've got to look at the labels. Here I take inches and square it, so I get inches times inches, and here I have another times inches. That gives me three factors, so my answer becomes inches cubed. Now you're going to get a difference whether you use the pi key or the 3.14. I use the pi key, but when I'm checking your final, I certainly will know the difference, and please show me the work and label your answer to get full credit. So teacher, pause the video if students need to punch this into the calculator or add it to their notes. Welcome back. Let's clean it off and go back to our PowerPoint. And there was my answer set up. And let's go on to this next one. The next one said the volume of a cylindrical storage tank uh, to find it if the diameter is 40 feet. So first of all, in your head it should be going, but the formula needs radius. So if the diameter is 40 feet, think about what the radius is and the height is 12 feet. So let's go to our slate and we know that the diameter is 40 feet. Remember the diameter is twice the radius, so if the diameter is 40 feet, that means the radius must be 20 feet. The labels stay the same, and the height was 12 feet. All right, so make sure those are the numbers that you're going to punch into your calculator. So here we go. The right formula is volume equals pi r squared h. So we put in pi. The radius was 20 feet and we're going to square that, and the height is 12 feet. So in your calculator, you can push this in if you have ex exponents in parentheses and a pi key. If you don't, you can push in 3.14 times 20 times 20 times 12. And when I push this in, I got 15,079.5. 64 and again feet times feet times feet give me feet to the third power and remember you will lose points if you do not put in the labels on the answer all right so pause the video if you need to and i'll meet you back here in a minute welcome back let's go back to our powerpoint and check exactly the right answer so let's go on to number three Please remember to read these because this time it changed from a cylinder to a sphere with a radius of 16 inches. All right, so let's go to our slate and remember that we needed radius. So here the radius was 16 inches. Let's find the formula. The formula of a cylinder is volume equals 4 thirds pi 
are raised to the third power because remember it's three dimensions. So when we punch it in here, four thirds times pi times 16 inches cubed. So if you have a calculator with parentheses, you put in four divided by three to make the, make the fraction times pi times 16, and the key you use is the little caret key, three. If you don't have that, here's what you punch in. You punch in four divided by three. If you don't have parentheses, it won't make any difference, times 3.14 times 16 times 16 times 16. I have parentheses and I have the up arrow key or the caret key and I came out with the answer of um, 17,000. Let me make sure I'm on the right one. Yeah, 17,157.28 cubic inches. If you use this, your answer will be a little bit different, but it should be very close to that answer. All right, pause if you need to. Welcome back. All right, let's go back to our PowerPoint. Let's check. Correct. All right, now number four says, find the volume of a spherical water storage tank with diameter of 16, or I'm sorry, of 36 feet. Remember, this formula needs radius, not diameter. So let's go to our slate. If the diameter of this particular um, sphere is 36 feet, divide it by 2 and you get the radius, so the radius is 18 feet. So again, go to your formula, volume equals 4 thirds pi r cubed. So I'm going to punch in my calculator, 4 thirds, 4 divided by 3, times pi, times 18 raised to the third power. Again, if you don't have one of those calculators that have parentheses in the up caret or the um, up arrow key, you could put in 4 divided by 3 times 3.14 times 18 times 18 times 18. I got an answer of 24,429.02 and the answer will be in cubic feet. Right. So pause the video if you need to. Welcome back. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. Let's check. That's how it's set up and looks great. So number five is a different kind of problem. Now we've changed and we want to solve by graphing. When we solve by graphing, what we really want to do is find out where those two lines intersect. So let's go to our slate and see how we can do. So the first one is y equals 2x minus 1. It's already in slope-intercept form, so the two pieces of information I need are the slope. That's the coefficient of the x, or the number out in front of the x is 2. Remember, slope is rise over run, so I make it into a fraction of 2 over 1. The y-intercept is negative 1. So let's go and see how we can do. Oops, well, it's all right. I've got a better graph drawn just to show you in just a minute. And on your test, you will have a nice graph drawn. The y-intercept is negative 1, so I put a dot at negative 1. Its slope is 2, so I go up 2 over 1. And I connect the dots with a straight line. And I'll just make that dot a little bit bigger. And then the next equation is y equals negative x plus 5. So the slope is the coefficient. Remember, we don't write a 1 but we know that there's a negative 1 out in front, so that means negative 1 over 1, and the y-intercept is 5. So I've got it up to 4, so I'll extend the line, 5. So we go down 1, right 1, down 1, right 1, down 1, right 1, make my line. Ooh, I almost hit some of the dots. And if we look, we want to find out where it crosses. So it crosses, and I'll tell you the right answer is actually at 2, 3. This is a pretty bad graph. So on yours, take a hint from me and use a straight edge, like the edge of your book or something to make a straight line. And then let's go back. Let's, let's pause the video if you need to, but then let's go back. To our PowerPoint and you'll see there's a nice graph. I did it with my graphing calculator and it shows you exactly where they cross. You also have the ability to go back. So let's go back to the slate and I, sh I can show you how you'll check. Our two equations were y equals 2x minus 1 
and the other one was y equals negative x plus 5. We found the answer to be from our graphing 2, 3. So this is the x and this is the y. And it needs to, and I tried to move that. Let me move it back. Now, if I substitute it in, it should make a true statement. So my y is 3 when my x is 2. I want to make sure that makes a true statement. 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3. That's true. That checked. Let's put it in here. 3 equals negative times 2 plus 5. Negative 2 plus 5 is 3. Here it checked also, so I know my answer is correct because I checked it algebraically. All right, pause if you need to. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint, and let's try the next one. The next one, these are not in slope-intercept form, so the very first thing I need to do is put them, solve them each for y. So let's go to our slate, and here we go. 2x plus y equals 4. I need to solve it for y, so I'm going to move the x's to the other side by subtracting 2x. So I get y equals negative 2x plus 4. All right, so I know my slope is negative 2. Make it a fraction, rise over 1, run negative 2 over 1, and my y-intercept is 4. All right, my next equation is x minus y equals negative 1. Move the x to the other side. So I get negative y equals negative x minus 1. I'm going to divide everybody by negative 1 to make the y positive. So I get y equals x plus 1. So the slope is, remember the coefficient is 1. So I'm going to make it 1 over 1. And the y-intercept is also positive 1. So let's go to my slate and draw a graph over here. And let's graph these. All right, first of all, the y-intercept is 4. Let's put some more tick marks. And the y-intercept was 4 and the slope was negative 2, so I go down 2 and over 1, go down 2 and over 1, and there's my first line. All right, second one, the y-intercept is 1, and the slope is 1, or 1 over 1, so I go up 1, over 1, and so it looks like it crosses at the point 1, 2. All right. So let's check to make sure. Let's put it into the top one. So x is 1 and y is 2 and see if they work. Is 2 times 1 plus 2 equal to 4? 2 times two, two times 1 is 2. 2 plus 2 equals to 4. That checks. Let's try this one. x is 1, y is 2. And does that equal to negative 1? 1 minus positive 2. It checks, so we're sure that our answer is correct. And that was a little bit better graph. Pause if you need to. Welcome back. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. There's my answer. Now, number 7 is a really long problem, but let's figure this out. Two road crews are paving a straight section of highway. Okay. Important, but no math information there. The first crew is responsible for paving the eastbound lanes. The second crew is for the westbound lanes. All right, still no mathematical things there, but here it comes. The first crew already has paved 40 kilometers <clears throat> and is paving three additional kilometers per day. So its rate is three kilometers per day. The second crew has already paved 80 kilometers and is paving one additional kilometer per day. Now we want to find out after how many days will the two crews have paved the same amount of road. Alright, so let's go to our slates and find out. Here's the first crew. The first crew's already paved 40 miles or 40 kilometers plus they're paving 3 kilometers per day. So X is going to be the number of days and y is the distance or the number of kilometers paved. The second crew is pay, has already paved 80 and they're only doing 1x per day. All right, so we need to graph these and see where they cross. But remember, this is a real life situation. I can't have negative days. I cannot have negative kilometers. So when I graph this, I really only want to graph in the first quadrant where everything is positive. And I'll make sure that the graph looks like that. So I need to go up. I'm going to go by tens. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. 
Here's the kilometers or the distance. Now these are days. So I've got days, let's go, let's go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and 40. So in this one, my slope is 3, which means 3 over 1, rise over run, and the y-intercept is 40. So 10, 20, 30, here's 40 kilometers. And what I've got is a slope of 3. Now remember, these are by 10s. So if I go up to 50, 60, I'm going to go up 30, 1, 2, 3, and I'm going to go over 10 because I'm going to make this as to make my graph 30 over 10 also reduces. So here's the first graph, like that. Here, this guy, the y-intercept is 80. The slope is 10 or 1, which can be 10 over 10 in this case, since I've got everything pretty much by 10. So 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. Go up 10 over 10. Here's my graph. I want to find out where that crosses, and it wants it in days, so I read down, and it's 20 days. Now, if we plug in 20 days, these two things, I want to find out if they're equal to each other. So let's put the 20 in the first equation, put the 20 in the second equation, and see if they come out. 3 times 20 is 60, plus 40 is 100. 20 plus 80 is 100, so that's where they cross. It didn't ask me to find out how many kilometers they um, paved, just how many days. So pause the video if you need to, and I'll meet you back here in a minute. Welcome back. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. There's a much nicer graph right there. Now, we want to solve by substitution. When it gives you a method to do, you must use that method. So we're going to solve these by substitution. We've already solved by graphing, so let's go to our slate and see. y equals x plus 7. The second equation is 2x minus y equals negative 9. Well, this one's already solved for y, so I'm going to use that. Wherever there's a y in the other equation, I'm going to put in x plus 7. So here I go, 2x minus, oh, there's the y. That's where I'm going to substitute the x plus 7. 2x, now I'm going to distribute the negative. Negative times x is negative x. Negative times 7 is negative 7. Let's add the like terms. 2x minus x is x. Now I've got to get the x all by itself. The opposite or inverse of subtracting 7 is adding 7. So I get x equals negative 2. Now remember, your answer is going to be an ordered pair, so x is negative 2. And then I can put it into either equation. I think I'll put it into the top one just because it looks easier. And negative 2 plus 7 is 5. Now we know it works in this one. Let's just check if we want to. And we can just do this mentally, but I'm going to do it in writing and see if this comes out to be true. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4, minus 5 is negative 9. That equals to negative 9, it checks. Now you don't have to check, but if you want to, you may. All right, so pause the video if you need to. All right, let's go back to our slate, or back to our PowerPoint. There's my answer, and I actually did it in the same way. Now this one, the next problem, number 9, is going to be x plus plus y equals 4, and then 3x plus 5y equals 15. Let's go to our slate, and you have your choice. We have x plus y equals 4. We have 3x plus 5y, and let me get that nice number, is 15. I think I'm going to solve one of these in the, new, in the first equation just because their coefficients are 1. So I think I'm going to solve it for y. So I'm going to move x to the other side. Of course you may have solved it for x if you wanted to. All right, I've used this equation once, I can't use it again. So wherever in the other equation I see a y, I'm going to put in negative x plus 4. So let's go 3x plus 5, there's the y. I'm going to substitute in negative x plus 4 equals to 15. So 3x, let's distribute. 5 times negative x is negative 5x. 5 times 4 is 20. Now we're back into just solving an equation. 3x minus 5x is negative 2x. 
let's subtract 20. I get negative 2x equals negative 5. Divide both sides by negative 2, so I get x equals 5 halves. Remember, in the ordered pairs, x's come before y's. Now, I'm going to substitute it in right here to find out what my y is. y is negative x is 5 halves plus 4. So I get negative 5 halves plus 4 over 1. Remember, when you're adding fractions, all you have to do is multiply the denominators and then cross multiply. Negative 5 plus 8 is 3, and there's my answer. Now, I'm not going to check this one because I did it a little bit differently on the PowerPoint. So there's your answer. X is 5 halves, Y is 3 halves. So let's go back to our slate. Remember, you can always pause, teacher, if you want to. And there. Now, this time, I solved it for um, the other way. I solved it for X. I got X equals negative Y plus 4, but I still got the same answer. And that's exactly why it works and why it's so wonderful. All right, let's look at number 10. It says the ABC Big Box Store delivers some bricks and some blocks. There were six more bricks than blocks. Each brick cost a dollar and each, blocks co each block cost three dollars. How many bricks and blocks were delivered if the bill was $38? And note, you don't have to worry about taxes or a delivery fee or anything else. So let's go to our slate. And clear it off. Thank you. And so we have two things. I'm going to let x equal the number of bricks. I'm going to let y equal the number of blocks. So let's find out some facts. They said in the problem there are six more bricks. So there's more bricks than blocks. So I'm going to say the bricks equal the blocks plus six. And then it said the total value of my order was $38. So each brick cost $1, each block cost $3, and it added to $38. All right. So this one's already solved. I'm going to use the substitution method, and I'm going to substitute in. So I got 1, x is y plus 6, plus 3y equals 38. Now remember, this is a real life problem. I probably don't, as a construction worker, want to buy partial bricks, parts of bricks, or parts of block. So the answer should come out to be a whole number. So when I distribute, I get y plus 6, because 1 times each one of them stays the same. Let's add y plus 3y is 4y. The inverse of adding 6 is subtracting 6, so I get 4y equals 32. Divide by 4, so y equals 8. So I could just come up here and say that there's 8 blocks. Now I'm going to substitute that in right here to find out what x is. x is 8 plus 6, so x is 14 bricks. So I'm just going to come up here and put 14 bricks. Now, on, the, on your test, if you just tell me x and, what x and y equals, you'll at least get a point and make sure you label your answer. So pause the video if you need to, and I'll meet you back here in a minute. Welcome back. Let's go on. Let's check. Got the same answer. And now this one wants us to solve by elimination, or some textbooks call it the addition method. So let's go ahead and go to our slate, and I have 5x plus 3y is equal to 73. I have 3x minus 3y is equal to 15. Remember with elimination, you want them to be in the same format, where the x's are in the same spot, the y's are in the same spot, the equals are in the same spot, and the plain old numbers are in the same spot. This is, in this, this is good, the formats are the same. Then I look at my equations and say, if I add these two equations together, will either variable be eliminated? Well, if I add x and 3x, I get 8x. Those aren't eliminated. But if I add 3y and negative 3y, they're eliminated. So I don't need to do any more work except to add these up. x plus 3x is 8x. These cancel because they're opposites or inverses. Over here, I get 88. Divide both sides by 8, and I get x equals 11. So in my answer, x is 11. Now I've got to find y. I can substitute it into either equation. I think I'll just pick the first one, and x plus 3y equals 73. So I'm going to pick 11 is my value for x, and I'm going to solve this. 
I get 55 plus 3y equals 73. Move the 55 to the other side. I get 3y equals 18. Divide by 3, so I get y equals 6. Now, you're saying, well, what happens if I plugged it, plugged it back into the second one? Let's see what happens and see if I get the same answer. So I get 33 minus 3y equals 15. Move the 33 to the other side by subtracting 33. I get negative 3y equals 18, um, 18 and it's negative. Divide both sides by negative 3, and I get y equals 6. I got the, the same answer. And that's why on your test, I'll have to look at exactly how you solved each of the equations and follow it through. All right, let's clear this off. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. Got the same answers. Now this one, this is still solving it by elimination. But in this case, if I look at them, they're in the same format, but they're not going to eliminate because 3x and plus 4x is 7x. 4y plus negative 2y is 2y. So let's go to our slates and see what happens. All right, let's look at this. 3x plus 4y equals 7. 4x minus 2y equals 24. All right, I talked to you about that they don't cancel out, but I noticed these two are already opposite in sign. And if I just multiply this guy by 2, he'll be 4. So that's what I think I'll do. I'll multiply that by 2. So I get 3x plus 4y equals 7. I get 8x minus 4y equals 48. So I get 11x equals 55. Let's divide both sides by 11. So I get x equals 5. So in my answer, x is 5. Let's plug it back in. 3 times 5 plus 4y equals 7. 15 plus 4y equals 7. Move the 15 to the other side by subtracting 15. Divide both sides by 4, and I get y equals negative 2. Now that's one way I could have done it. Now, if you take these and you go, oh, Here's another way I could have done it. Remember, maybe I want to multiply both of these guys. So I bring the 4 up here and the 3 down here, and I'm going to make the bottom one negative. So 4 times 3x is 12x. 4 times 2 is 8y. 4 times 7 is 28. 3 times 4x is negative 12x. Negative 3 times 2, negative 2y is 6y. And negative 3 times 24 is negative 72. So I get 14y equals, now let me do this, I gotta do it quick. 4, 44. No, 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 no. 4y equals 4 times 20. Uh, like, oh, here's my mistake. This is 16. So I get 22y equals 44. Divide both sides by 22. So y is, and it should be negative, y is negative 2. And then plug it in and we'll get the same thing. So teacher, pause the video and I'll meet you back here in a couple minutes. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and go back to our PowerPoint. And let's check. There we go, we got the same answer. And now, here's a word problem solved by elimination. A subdivision has 100 lots. There are 10 less lots for two-story homes than for one-story homes. How many of each type of lot are there? So let's go to our slate, and let's look at this. So I'm gonna let x equal the number of two-story lots. I'm going to let y equal the number of one-story lots. So what I have here is, first of all, I know that the number of lots is 100. So x plus y equals 100. Right? Then it said that there are 10 less lots for two-story homes. So then I'm going to say there's the number of one-story homes must be the number of two-story homes plus 10, because this is 10 more. Now, it wants us to solve by elimination. 
So I need to, I need to solve one of these. So what I'm going to do is take the second one and make its format look like the first one. So I'm going to subtract x. So I get x plus y equals 100. I get negative x plus y equals 10. Now, when I look at them, these will cancel. y plus y is 2y equals 110. Divide by 2, so y is 55. So y is 55 one-story lots. So then I can plug it into, why don't I plug it into the first one? x plus 55 equals 100. I'm going to subtract 55. So x equals 45. So there's 45 two-story lots. Excellent. All right, take a second and pause if you need to. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. There we go, got the same answer. All right, now we want to graph this inequality. Remember with inequalities, we're going to shade, and we also have to decide whether the inequality is going to has a solid line or a dotted line. So let's go to our slate, and let's look. We have y is greater than 4x minus 1. It's already in slope-intercept form, because remember the first thing is I'm thinking about the line y equals 4x minus 1. So the slope is 4, make it a fraction, rise over 1. The y-intercept is negative 1. So let's go to our graph. Luckily on the test again and on the, on the review, we've had um, graphs already drawn. So the y-intercept is negative 1. I put a dot at negative 1. Its slope is 4 over 1, so I go up 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and over 1. Now I have to decide, is the line dotted or is it solid? And I look at my inequality. It's greater than. It's not greater than or equal to. So this line is dotted. Now I have to decide which side to shade, over here or over here. So I pick a point that's not on the line. Now the origin's awfully close to that line. So I think I'm going to pick this point right here as my test point. That's the point 3, 0. So I go y is greater than 4x minus 1. So is 0 greater than 4 times 3 minus 1? Well, 4 times 3 is 12 minus 1. Is 0 greater than 11? No. So I shade the opposite side. So I shade everything up in here. And that's the answer. So pause the video if you need to. Welcome back. Let's go back to our slates. And there's my answer. Much prettier graph there. All right, let's go on to number 15. Y is less than or equal to. Notice it's an equal to, so already I know that the line is going to be a solid line. So let's go ahead and go to my slate and take a look at this one. Y is less than or equal to 1 third X plus 3. All right, so my slope is one third. Look, it's a fraction, but it helped me out because that's what it needs to be for slope. And the y-intercept is three. I look at this and I know that the graph has to have a solid line. So let's go to my graph. Put some tick marks on here. My y-intercept is three. Now the slope is one third, so I go up one and over three. I know the line's going to be solid. And so now I have to decide. This time I can pick the origin. And I like to pick the origin because it makes the math a little bit easier. So here I'm going to substitute in for y0 and for x0. Is 0 less than or equal to 1 third of 0 is 0 plus 3 is 3. Is 0 less than or equal to 3? Yes. So I'm going to shade the side that has the origin on it. And there's my answer. So pause the video if you need to. Welcome back. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Oh, and there's my graph. Looks much nicer there again. All right, so number 16 is graph x is greater than or equal to 2. Again, I know the line is going to be solid. So let's go to my, uh, my slate. x is greater than or equal to 2. I'm really thinking about the line x equals 2. And notice x equals 2 is a vertical line. He doesn't have a slope. So what we have here, because we have no y, 
So x is equal to 2 is going to be right here. It's a vertical line through 2. It's solid because of the equal sign right there. And it says greater than. Everything's out here because over here x is 3, x is 4, x is 5. And there's my graph. Pause if you need to. Welcome back. Let's go back to, there's my answer. And let's go to 17. It says state the vertices of the feasible region. Now the feasible region is this region that's right in here that's colored and, and there's dots there. So I want you to find the vertices, that's the corners. So what you're going to do is look at this graph and find out what's the name of this point. Well this point is the point 3, 0. This point is the point 7, 0. This is the point 5, 2. And this is the point 3, and let's just call it 3, uh, I'm sorry, this is the point 3, 3. So let's just call it good enough there. So now let's go to our next question. There's my answers. And it wants me to maximize this. Maximize it using the objective function. So let's go ahead and go to our slate. The objective function said z equals 5x plus, I believe it was 3y. And they want us to maximize. So I'm going to put down all my vertices. 3, 0 is one vertice. The next vertice was 7, 0. The next vertice was 5, 2. And then we had 3, 3. Order here doesn't matter. So I'm going to plug it in. 5 times 3 plus y is 0. And I get 15. 5 times 3 is 15. 3 times 0 is 0. 5 times 7 plus 3 times 0 gives me 35. 5 times 5 is 25 plus 3 times 2 is 6. 25 plus 6 is 31. Plug it into the last one. 5 times 3 plus 3 times 3. 5 times 3 is 15. 3 times 3 is 9. This is 24. It wanted me to maximize, so which one of these is the biggest? 35. So the maximum is 35 and it occurs at the point 70. And there's my answer. All right, pause the video if you need to. Welcome back. Let's go back. Let's check exactly what I got before. All right, here's another one. Find the feasible regions, vertices. That means this corner, this corner right here is 20, this corner is 30, this vertice is 34. This vertice is 0, 4, and this vertice is 0, 1. So let's see if we got them all. We did. Now the last question wants you this time to minimize. So let's go to our slates, and we're going to minimize. Remember, minimize means the smallest answer. So here we go. We have z equals 4x minus y. So we're going to put down all our points, and again, the order doesn't matter. I have 0, 1. I have the point 0, 4, the point 2, 0, the point 3, 0, and the point 3, 4. So all we have to do is put them in. So 4 times 0 minus 1. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. 4 times 0 minus 4 gives me negative 4. 4 times 2 gives me 8. Minus 0 still gives me 8. 4 times 3 is 12, minus 0 gives me 12. 4 times 3 is 12, minus 4. Is that right? 12 minus 4 is also 8. Oops. Also 8. So out of these numbers, which is the smallest, the minimum is negative 4, and it occurs at the point 0, 4. And there's the review for the final. I'll meet you there on finals day.